This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today, we have an extremely distinguished guest on our show. So we are going to talk to Professor Silvio Michaeli, who is a professor at MIT's uh, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. Now, Professor Michaeli is a recipient of the Godel Prize and the Turing Award, two of the biggest awards in computer science. And I actually came to know of Professor Michaeli's work when I was researching Zcash uh, in the last year. So in Zcash, we have this knowledge of uh, zero knowledge proofs or ZK snarks. And it turns out that Professor Michaeli is the co-inventor of the idea itself of zero knowledge proofs. So he wrote a paper in 1985, the knowledge complexity of interactive proof systems, where he you know, sort of went into the idea of zero knowledge. So, but I was surprised, pleasantly surprised to discover this year, at the beginning of this year, that he has come out with uh, a new consensus algorithm and which has the potential to power cryptocurrency-like systems and blockchain-like systems in the future. And he calls this system Algorand. So we're going to talk to about Algorand in this particular interview over the next hour. So, but before we st start, let's perhaps have some words from, from the professor himself and Professor, tell us how you got to be interested in the field of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so I somehow I, um, I've been working um, in cryptography for a long time. Then I took a pause and started working in game theory. And, uh, but I heard about Bitcoin in the background. And so finally, I decided to ask, so, well, what, what is Bitcoin? And once I heard about it, I thought for a while and said, could you please one more time, and uh, so I got a second explanation. Then I saw, I said, wow, this is a great idea. And uh, point one, but point two, you know, uh, can one do better? And then that's what I got interested in, trying to somehow improve uh, the whole, um, whole approach. And in fact, actually at the end, I ended up starting with a, a totally new approach uh, altogether. So Bitcoin was my main motivator, and I think actually he has motivated a lot of people. So whoever uh, uh, Mr. Nakamoto is, you know, thank you very much. So, uh, so Professor, there's this. Uh, there's only one video about Algorand on the internet where uh, I think uh, you're talking at uh, one of the events uh, celebrating Professor Wittgenser's Wittgerson's work, and you're talking about Algorand, and you mentioned like. Bitcoin as like a beautiful, beautiful invention that is going to change how society works. So wh wh why do you think that this invention is important from a computer science perspective? What Bitcoin uh, uh, wants to do is to implement uh, a shared uh, ledger. And so somehow, you know, we need to have as a society a way to generate consensus about a few things that are important to us. So to think about it that there is, uh, if you have a guarantee that there is, you know, every 10 minutes, a page of a newspaper, which, you know, you know that whatever you're reading, the rest of the world is reading. And so we record there what is important, transactions, in, uh, for example, and then another 10 minutes, there is another page that everybody uh, uh, somehow agrees upon. So what I'm reading, you are reading, and this somehow essentially common knowledge idea is very, very powerful. So if you look at the internet as it is and as a web, is a repository of information, but the timing of it is not clear. It's not clear that um, um, whatever I, I see really is uh, uh, the same thing that you see. And so one needs to put uh, some kind of a law and order of the internet and, so, and, and, and on the web. And if this, uh, they have been so useful right now, think how much more useful they're going to be if you have also this other uh, um, common knowledge aspect to it and timed aspect to it. And so that is, there is uh, no question in my mind that that is uh, uh, extremely uh, useful uh, 
um, tool to have for a society, particularly for a, a modern and digital society. And the question is really, how do we really bring uh, into existence? What is the right way to bring it into existence? So in, in your paper, um, so I, I have to say, we, uh, we, were, we were talking about this earlier. It's a fascinating paper. It's a fascinating uh, idea. Uh, I, there's, a, there's a talk um, that uh, we'll link to in the show notes, which, in which you explain the, the concept of this paper. But for someone who doesn't have a mathematical or engineering background, it is a daunting thing to look at because um, it, uh, it, it it's about well, it's quite long, and it's it's a lot of mathematical formulas um, that you need a high level of technicity to understand. Uh, so we'll, we'll try to make this discussion as, and I'm sure we will because you're very good at at explaining things and and and, um, and very articulate. But uh, in the paper, you you start by describing some of the technical limitations of proof of work and some of the requirements in a cryptocurrency cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. Um, so could you take us through some uh, of those key points? Somehow, uh, Bitcoin is uh, predicated on the honest majority of uh, uh, the miners that are this specialized group that somehow generate blocks, a block being a page of this uh, uh, global newspaper that uh, appears every 10 minutes. Uh, uh, to all of us, and um, so that uh, in, in so far uh, um, to have a requirement of honesty doesn't bother me at all. In fact, actually, I believe uh, uh, that honesty exists. Society would not exist at all if uh, uh, somehow there was not an, uh, an honest majority out there. So that doesn't bother me. But what uh, bothers me is uh, the uh, assuming the honest majority of a specialized group of people and namely these miners, which essentially is quite orthogonal to us as a users in general. Originally, um, uh, in, the, in the original conception, I could be a miner and a user, you could be a miner and a user. But then it turns out of it, you know, somehow from the structure of the Bitcoin, the incentives were such that you know, mining, so generating blocks, meaning deciding being able to print the page of a newspaper that everybody reads every 10 minutes is becoming so computational expensive and actually so expensive in electricity uh, alone because computation is powered by electricity that you, know, you and I uh, are going to lose money despite the rewards that they are given by Bitcoin to the producer of the page uh, every 10 minutes if we attempt to do it. And so there are right now five mining pools, groups of people who join together to try in this uh, giant effort to print the page. And uh, there are now five consortia, five, five pools. And so when you actually ask about uh, the majority of just uh, out of five pools, uh, that is a little bit a lot to ask. I have no problem assuming the majority of the users you know, in the world or, or in anything of you know, it, <laughs> because if, if there is not a majority of users right there, we are, uh, A, life is not worth living, and life will be very short. Society will crumble. But somehow, to put you know, uh, this uh, extraordinary power, deciding what is going to be printed in, in every page, every 10 minutes, into the hands of uh, five groups of people, that is, to me, is not, a, I'm sure it was not whatever Mr. Nagamoto originally intended. So that is um, um, a problem, not the honest majority of, of uh, um, society, but the honest majority of miners, uh, yes. Another problem is, uh, uh, of course, this uh, waste of uh, power. Uh, so my understanding is that, you know, with uh, relatively few users, um, uh, Bitcoin already absorbs, you know, from the production of this uh, page every 10 minutes, you know, somehow so much electricity as a small country, and this uh, does not scale. And I believe that, you know, if you really want to have a public ledger, that brings us together and generate common knowledge, you know, in business, in society, as a, in, in, in all of humanity, you know, <laughs> it has to scale um, uh, much better. And, um, and the other point that, uh, that, I, uh, that worries me is this uh, forks, uh, because somehow in the design of Bitcoin, it happens to be a fork. So think of it like that you're watching somehow uh, the page uh, of this newspaper appear at 10 minutes, and suddenly, for the next page, there are two contenders or three contenders. 
And so somehow, uh, that, of course, it generates some ambiguity in the poor reader because it says, you know, how do I know now what other page everybody uh, is reading and focusing in? So I'm uh, seeing the same thing that everybody else is seeing. And there is a, a, a fork resolution, some way in which later on, somehow, we are going to uh, have another single sequence of pages out there. Uh, but somehow, we had to wait um, uh, quite a while for this to, to happen. Very often, you, you cannot rely on the content of a, 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 a one page unle until, uh, say, when, uh, uh, five more pages have been actually appended. And uh, actually, if you want to have a probability that is a really small, uh, that this page is not going to disappear and is going to remain in our common history, you have to wait not for six more pages to appear, but maybe 20. So uh, if you if you think about it, 10 minutes a page, and uh, you have to have a delay of 20, or uh, six is an hour, and, and 20 is <laughs> it's much more. So it's three hours. So that is, uh, uh, is uh, a little bit uh, of a burden. And moreover, I believe that you know, the notion of ambiguity, uh, that, uh, that whenever you see something on, 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 on a page, you cannot rely on it right away because there is this lingering ambiguity. Psychologically, is very disturbing because uh, for the success of the oper of operation, um, and not only for a speed, uh, you actually need uh, to have uh, some uh, very strong sense that uh, once a page is out there, you can rely on it and it's not going to disappear on you. And uh, yes, uh, if you see it, everybody will see it and uh, we can assume uh, uh, that it's common knowledge and keep going. Does this all make sense? And objectively, uh, I think, you know, if you, if you look at the Bitcoin protocol with, with a fresh set of eyes and uh, uh, you, you can look at these problems and say objectively that these are, these are issues that perhaps would prevent it from scaling or would make it uh, vulnerable to certain types of attacks. And, and this is what you this is what you lay out here. Now, I'm curious, have you tried uh, confronting these ideas to the people in certain Bitcoin forums, for instance? <laughs> No, I must say that uh, I came uh, to this, you know, essentially like you know, a scientist and an academic. So, uh, so I, I, I'm not, uh, uh, I did not uh, somehow publish in a Bitcoin forum, uh, fora, and I did not, uh, um, I'm not a, a part of this. I just, you know, I, I, I just went to the design board and say, okay, if uh, if you don't want to rely on miners, if you don't want to concentrate the powers in, in, in five hands, if you don't want to have this lingering ambiguity that actually um, uh, translates uh, into um, a long time, uh, to a uh, long wait to, uh, uh, to certainly certainty, and if you want to reduce the cost of production, uh, because otherwise, you know, it really is not going to scale, what do you do? And then, you know, I just uh, went on, uh, on, on, on my own path. Uh, I was being slightly facetious because uh, I know that I know how these types of um, very objective facts somehow get uh, misconstrued by 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 certain types of people uh, in certain specific forms. Um, but yeah, enough of that. So you also outlined the properties of a good public distributed ledger. Uh, take us through what, in your opinion, are uh, good properties for a good pub public distributed ledger. First of all, it should be should work uh, in a permissionless environment. So, in other words, you, know, um, uh, you should be always open to new users coming in anytime they want and uh, being being part of the operation. It should be computationally trivial, very uh, very fast, so that you know it's not going to absorb you know how much of our computation power and is very low cost. It should have actually um, it should have. Uh, in my opinion, every page, as soon as it appears, they can be relied upon uh, instantly rather than having to, have, you know, uh, to wait for long. And uh, the, num the total number of uh, bits uh, sent around uh, should be low. And uh, in my opinion, then I should have uh, no forks. So I already said this, but also should have a very strong uh, uh, security. Uh, but, uh, because in my opinion, if the ledger is going to become useful to humanity, if uh, and the world, the society really realize on it, and the business in particular as a part of society realize on it, you can be sure it's going to be attacked. And so we, we need to have a, a, a stronger model of a security to, um, for having you know, the ledger that we deserve and want. 
So one of the specialities, I think, uh, about Algorand is that you actually define uh, the stronger notion of security and you and in, and you define a notion of adversary as well, right? Like, so in, in all of the cryptographic protocols, we always have this notion of adversary that's either trying to listen on the communications or is trying to break the security of systems. And you have your own unique definition of uh, what should be considered as an adversary when one designs a, a distributed ledger, a ledger protocol. So uh, could you walk us through this notion of an adversary? Of of so first of, of all, your I, notion of but uh, adversary is not a notion. <laughs> I'm afraid to say <laughs> something that everybody knows, so it's a truism. That adversaries are a reality. So I said uh, before that I really believe that uh, there is no society without honest majority. So there is ma honesty, but there is also gratuitous malice. And very often uh, we have been a little bit. Uh, cavalier when discussing about the adversary because they, oh the system is secure because you know an adversary is not profitable to be an adversary i mean very often out there the way there are people who are honest uh, thanks goodness there are also people who are actually want to be uh, malicious uh, um, uh, for his own sake and if they want to bring the the system to a halt they may not make a dime but they feel proud you know think about people who spread the viruses you know very often they don't have uh, much to gain at all so I believe that you know, if you really want to have a fundamental infrastructure, and if you don't believe that to have a very strong adversarial model, uh, we are not having actually a practical infrastructure. And actually, is a, we are going to have a dangerous infrastructure, we, we can, because in some sense, we will be better off without it than relying on something that ultimately is not secure at all. So in my view, here is what I'd like to have an adversary. Uh, adversaries can uh, able to corrupt anyone he wants whenever he wants, instantly. Perhaps we can actually put a, a budget of how many you can do, and that is, a, is, a, is an old approach. Perhaps you cannot corrupt more than a third of the users in the world. And actually, if you're thinking about a, a, a infrastructure that is used by millions and millions and millions and millions of people over the internet, you know, and if you can corrupt a 10%, it's a miracle. This is going to be, it takes time to corrupt. And then more, my, nonetheless, they say, take a, you can corrupt anybody who wants up to, say, a certain percentage, say 10%, 20%, 30%, if you really want to be uh, very pessimistic and very, very safe. And then you want to say, now that I've corrupted, actually, I can they do my bidding. So, I mean, I really seized your computer. Now, your computer no longer belongs to you, but belongs to me, the bad guy. And I can let you say any message you want and now organize perfectly all the bad people, okay? Because if we prepare and defeat this adversary, actually, we are going to be safe. And if we think it's going to be something milder, we are not going to be safe. And trust me that there is, a, say, a currency that, ev that the world uses, and if somebody can prevent from transacting because nobody has access to his or her own money anyway, it will happen. So it's not you know, um, somehow um, um, so a fantasy. So that's what I really believe uh, is um, the adversary that I have in mind. So uh, is extremely powerful. However, is not capable of uh, uh, is computationally bounded. It cannot forge uh, digital signatures. And um, and uh, the only concession that I'm giving is that uh, that once you know a message is uh, sent out to the network, propagated virally in the network by an honest person, he cannot put the message back into the bottle. I mean, no, no more than uh, uh, a government can put back in the bottle a message which is virally spread by WikiLeaks. So when it's a bit, once it's out of the bottle, it's a bit too late to stop. But otherwise, can corrupt anybody, instantaneously organize them, and so on and so forth. So within the properties of uh, good public ledger, you, you talk about this notion of true democracy. And in, in the paper, you describe the fact that in, in Algorand, all um, participants are treated equal. So there's no distinction between miners and nodes and regular users and, and so on and so forth. And if you compare that to, it's quite novel because in, in other blockchain systems, that's not the case. So obviously in Bitcoin, it's not the case. And if you compare it to some newer, um, more scalable uh, BFT proof of stake type systems, like say Casper, for instance, uh, there is a there is a, um, 
network participants and validators who are offline are in fact penalized. And this is so that we we have a, a high network availability, right? If we if 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 miners are penalized for coming offline for coming offline. Uh, or validators rather, then we can assume that the network would say um, available and resilient. Uh, can you explain and then in, in how in Algorand you you counter this problem, uh, knowing that all my validators and, and nodes are the same and they can come in and out of the network at any time? Well, uh, all right. So <laughs> not everything is easily explainable, and uh, but uh, and. Uh, so first of all, um, uh, I think, yes, I think it's important that, uh, that somehow it's to be a democratic system because my faith is in the honesty of a majority of people. And uh, actually, if you want technically speaking, then uh, that, uh, the majority of the money in, uh, belongs to honest people. Um, that is, uh, is okay, which is, I believe it is true because after all, the money is in our pockets and uh, the majority of the money is in, in honest uh, People, that seems to be the safest assumption. Then I don't want to bet on the majority of this particular group of this other specialized group at all. And, and therefore, it is important that somehow the computation that is required to um, a, a user to be uh, mild enough that you can actually uh, do it without problems or even uh, in a background uh, in your laptop without uh, being, being worried. So, if uh, the participation is um, very computationally inexpensive, uh, in some sense, uh, you can say you can leave it on uh, your, your laptop the same way that you leave it on or um, uh, uh, application running uh, in the background anyway. And, uh, and that is very different than running a computational intensive uh, uh, operation. And so in some sense, uh, one can uh, somehow dismiss the, uh, uh, the fact that people want to go offline because staying, being online and giving this occasional light help uh, to Algorand is not, going to, uh, is not going to prevent you from doing anything else you want to do. But um, if you want to go one step farther, um, Algorand can actually somehow uh, tell you in advance uh, when uh, you are going to be uh, uh, you are going to be taking some uh, crucial steps when, when your intervention is really crucial, not just, just passing along messages, uh, facilitating the propagation of messages, uh, algorithm messages over the network, as I'm saying, you know, uh, Meher, Sebastian, somehow, if uh, please be online six months from now, from noon to noon or five, because uh, I think, you know, you're going to uh, boost, you know, the thing of the system. Of course, that is... Uh, a metaphor because Algorand is a collective protocol, is a totally distributed ledger. Nobody is going to tell you, you it's your time of things. But somehow you realize yourself when is crucial that you are going to act. And so, and I believe that if you are going to tell people, say, hey, if you know in advance in a year that you know one hour, that ten minutes that you're really needed, could you please possibly be there? And uh, I think uh, people will comply. It's a it's a kind of a different model. So think about it differently. Assume that. Uh, to say uh, so everybody should uh, vote in elections, but very often when you think that the election is a foregone conclusion, you can say, you know, I have better things to do. Now, mind you that being in Algorand in an election is quite different because Algorand runs in the background in a computer. In an election, I should personally go to the poll and cast my vote. But assume now that there is an election and say, Silvio, you know what? If you show up at this election, you are going to decide the next president you bet that I will show up. And I believe that most people will. So this notion that you can somehow actually, uh, not only being online because it costs you nothing to be online, nobody's going to require any uh, mining or expensive operation, but actually I can actually schedule and give you just a very short time windows when you actually have to show up and make a difference may actually solve the problem. Does this make any sense? I think that's the best I could do in, uh, in this context, to, in terms of explanation. Definitely, it, it, it definitely makes sense. Let's take a short break to talk about JAX. JAX is a multi-coin wallet created by the people at Decentral. Now in the past, if you had a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies, it was a pain to handle them. You either had to leave them on an exchange, which was insecure, or you had to have all these different wallets, which was a hassle. 
Fortunately, now with Jax, those medieval days of darkness, misery, and suffering are over. Jax supports multiple cryptocurrencies and new ones are being added. But it's not just storing cryptocurrencies you can do with Jax, but you can also exchange them directly from within inside the wallet thanks to their Shapeshift integration. And since there's only one seed, Jax makes it super easy to back up and sync to your other devices. Jax works with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and has browser extensions for Firefox and Chrome. So go to jax.io, that's J-A-X-X.io, to download the wallet and get started today. We'd like to thank Jax for their support of Epicenter. I think we've been talking about Algorand um, in multiple questions. So let's let's just have you describe Algorand, uh, in a, like a paint a broad brush in, in, in broad strokes and explain to us what are the key components that you're using to make Algorand. Right, so if I want to do it in broad stroke, and then I'm going to say is, is, um, is the following, what is the problem that we are actually facing here? The problem is that uh, uh, there are millions and millions of people all over the world, and we want to say, I have a, in, my, in my mind a page of a, of a paper that I, should be written. You have a different page of a paper that it should be written. So does everybody else. So it's a question of consensus, of, of agreement. We want to agree on a page in which everybody is behind that page. But you know, it should be my page, your page. So we need to have this, this agreement. And tell you the truth, this um, uh, 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 problem was actually discussed you know, and invented actually in the 80s. So it's over 30 years ago. And it's called the Byzantine Agreement. And it's a very, very strong type of agreement. You imagine if there is a powerful adversary uh, of the type that I was describing before, and despite this adversary could corrupt and totally control, say, up to a third of a player, you know, you are going to have all the good guys are going to uh, agree on a single page. Hey, that's wonderful. So then uh, aren't we done? Well, not really. Why? Because these protocols essentially want that everybody talks to everybody else over and over and over again in a sequence of rounds. And the question is, how many rounds? And so the number of rounds has to be one more than the possible number of bad people. So think of it, that assume that you have a, a medium deployment, right? So a million users, not much. And assume that the diversity can corrupt and control 10% of the users, which is already a lot. Okay, 10% of a million is 100,000. So you have to talk over and over and over again, or 100,000 plus one rounds. Now, that is a lot of talking. So even if you take a, a tenth of a second to implement a round, it's going to take 69 days to publish a single page of, of a paper. That cannot possibly work. So, and what uh, Mr. Nakamoto did is a totally different, um, um, a, a different approach. Essentially, he did to say, "Hey, when you, to each page, when you imagine your page of paper, you have actually to solve a, a very difficult computational reader. Think about an equation that is uh, that is uh, defined by uh, your own page, and yet to find the solution to this equation. So I work independently on the equation on my page." You work independently on the equation of your page. All equations are uh, equally hard, and they're hard enough so that uh, one person in the world, no matter how many people try, uh, in, in every 10 minutes, only one person is going to solve his own equation. And the one who solves it propagates his solution uh, to the equation and the page that goes with it. So if you look at it, what is magic and what I really much admire about Bitcoin is this idea that in this uh, agreement, we don't need to talk at all because uh, to talking back and forth with a million people can take a long time. But what I do, I stay in my own room, I solve my own equation relative to my page. And so does everybody else in parallel and separately. And then the one who succeeds then communicates the solution and the page. Uh, that uh, looks much better than before. The problem is that it introduces a long, a long computation because you must make sure the riddle, the equation you have to solve is hard enough that despite everybody's trying to solve it, only one every 10 minutes solve it. 
And the people who don't solve is just wasted work, et cetera, et cetera. And then the concentration of power, uh, latency, and everything else. But it's a brilliant idea. So what does Algorand do? I go back to the message passing Byzantine Agreement protocol. But I do two things. First, I find the Byzantine Agreement on steroids, which is very, very, very fast. So everybody, there are going to be the number of, of rounds of communication, think of it, is uh, nine in expectation. But nine, whether the, the, the users are a million, or a hundred million, or a billion, you only have to talk for expected nine times in a row. And moreover, everybody who has something to say in a round should send a single message, not a different messages to different people, like, like it was the case in the past. So you have only one message to, say, to send, and you have to, say, to send these messages and I expected nine times only. Wow, that's already uh, quite a better. And perhaps with a million uh, people, it could be uh, almost usable directly as it is. But then Algorand does something else. I want to have really super efficiency. So what I'm going to do, I take this protocol that could possibly work for a, a million, but say not for uh, 10 or, or more, 10 million or more, and say, and then and now I shrink the participants by a cryptographic process, say, to simplify computation, by a factor of a thousand. So rather than having a million people conducting this super efficient protocol, now I have a thousand people conducting this super efficient protocol. And that is so much better. So what you do is that you invent a new protocol, that's what Algorand does, provides a new protocol for Byzantine agreement, which has some extraordinary properties as it is. And furthermore, you don't even run it with the old users, but somehow you shrink the number of users in a guaranteed fair way to a random subset, say, of size a thousand all the old users. So even though whatever was uh, already relatively fast, now it becomes a thousand times faster. And, and therefore it becomes much easier to produce the page uh, we want to, to have produced. That is essentially, if I want to summarize in one way, in, 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 uh, in, two, in two steps of this application is Byzantine agreement, message passing Byzantine agreement, not proof of work of Byzantine agreement on steroids, and then shrinking Byzantine agreement in a guaranteed fair way to a, a much smaller subset of users. So uh, I think that was a brilliant explanation. And uh, just for the convenience of our future selves, let us give names to those two things, right? Like let us give, so tell us what the name of this Byzantine agreement on steroids is and tell us what the name of this method of shrinking from a million to a thousand that is. <laughs> okay, well, the name of the Byzantine agreement on steroids has two names. One is the nerdy name, and then I call it a BBA star, B binary Byzantine agreement, and, uh, and star, well, because it's a self-promoting question, I think it's really, it's a, uh, is a good Byzantine agreement uh, algorithm. Uh, but uh, the, the colloquial name is uh, Fast and Furious <laughs> Byzantine Agreement, because in some sense, that's what it is. So what are the names? Fast and Furious Byzantine Agreement, or BA star, if you, if you prefer. The other, uh, that is the, the agreement proper, the other technique to really shrink, instead, uh, a million users to, say, a thousand, as, as also name, and um, it's called the cryptographic sortition. So first of all, uh, the name was actually suggested by Morris Herdig, a friend of mine, and it's a great uh, name. Let me tell you what sortition is. Sortition is actually an ancient um, in, um, um, method to, uh, to decide magistracies in very ancient republics, uh, uh, such as Athens, uh, Florence, Venice, and so forth. And uh, in some sense, uh, those people felt that it was a good idea somehow to fill certain positions at random rather than, than um, by other, any other process. And so uh, cryptographic sortition is a way in which you rely on cryptography to guarantee to everybody that the people who are ultimately elected have been elected fairly and randomly. And in a way that is unambiguous. So 
everybody should drive. What, who are the fashion people in, in charge of this page, of agreeing on this page? Everybody should know what, who they are, and everybody should, uh, should uh, somehow uh, uh, believe that they've been fairly selected. And so um, why this is important? Because the page essentially is going to be digitally signed by a suitable majority of these FASM people. So if I know the FASM people, and as I see of, of this particular page, and if I see that this page has, signed, has been digitally signed by sufficiently many of these uh, uh, FASM people, then I'm happy, and everybody can rely on it. And um, so somehow, a bit better, if there is also secret cryptographic sortition. And that is uh, something that, you know, is even more unique to Algorand, in which it is a, a way to select people in a way that is secret and provable. Secret, so that nobody knows that you've been elected, but if you've been selected for participating to the small committee who, who, who is in charge of this page, you can prove it, but nobody knows in advance who is a part of this. So in some sense, what Algorand does is, in this, uh, by secret cryptographic sortition, is, ma is make sure that the people select themselves. And it's a, that's a very weird, because how do we, I select myself if I want to go, a, if I want to squ squish down a million people to a thousand, assume that I run my own private secret lottery in which I win with probability one in a thousand. So if everybody wins it, a probability one in a thousand, and there are a million people, how many winners there are going to be? Well, roughly on average, a thousand, right? Because a thousand times a thousand is, is a million. So the point is that Algorand does not ask a million people or 10 million or 100 million to talk in order to select together in a fair way a thousand people because so much talking is really a, a dog eating his own tail, right? I want to select the people. Uh, and that's going to take a while, so that then, once there are few, they can select the page. Eh, this is, is a circular argument. I want the people to s select themselves, and if they, they are selected, come back with the answer. To give you an analogy, perhaps, is this. I don't know, uh, I think that is, this is a way in which Google hire talented uh, people and mathematicians. Sometimes there is a web page or even some physical banner somewhere close to uh, universities, and you say, can you solve this mathematical uh, riddle? If you can, call this number. And that's how they recruit. And that's a very smart idea of recruiting because the, everybody, uh, millions of people try to solve it, but the few of them who actually solve this mathematical riddle call up and they are offered a job after presumably some additional interviewing. Think of the alternative. Even if Google were, um, uh, were the one who do it. So how many people should you hire to interview millions and millions of people who believe in good conscience to be talented enough to work at Google? So it's going to take forever and it's going to be very expensive process. Instead here by magic, you say, if you solve it on your own time, on your own time, only if you solve it, come back and report the solution and uh, you are interviewed right now. And essentially, by this you know, secret self-selection, Algorand has extreme efficiency because we don't need to talk at all about uh, uh, to, uh, to generate the committee, but if you're part of the committee, give me proof that you won your own lottery because your own lottery is not cheatable by you, even if, if, if it is uh, uh, you, you are the only one running it. So if you win, report and welcome to the committee. That essentially is the way um, uh, crypt uh, secret cryptographic sortition works. Okay, so is it correct to think that let's say there's there's a newspaper, right? And each page is um, like let's say one block, and you know you you have had a lot of them. So let's say the newspaper is already like twenty pages thick, and now we need to make the twenty first page, right? So in order to make the twenty first page. Uh, and there are like a million users, right? There are all, all the million users, they're holding some kind of currency like Bitcoin, right? like an Algorand coin or something. And now in order to make the 21st page, we need to select out of these million, uh, a thousand, and these thousand will be in charge of creating that 21st page. So 
my question is like let's say i am i am one of those million who got lucky and be, and uh, got selected to be is one of the 1000 to create that 21st page when do i get to know that i have the power to participate in the process to create the 21st page all right so there are uh, different uh, implementations of, of algorand but to say in the basic implementation as soon as uh, the 20th page is published you can determine right away whether you are uh, going to help to generate the 21st page yes or no immediately and you do some very simple local computation to you that is going to tell you whether you've been selected or not that is the answer to actually your question yeah okay now so now now if uh, now i'm i'm interested to know like w- what this puzzle is that is being used to do cryptographic sortation and the second question is if if my selection as one of the 1000 in the 20 in the 21st page depends on page number 20 then if i am an adversary if i if i can manipulate page number 20 then i could also make sure that page number the thousand people for page number 21 are also you know corrupt how do how do you prevent that wow man congratulations that is really a heart of a problem um, uh, is a, a main component of the problem and um, uh, the way actually you're totally right because if you select the 1000 people in charge of page 21 from the content of page 20 and uh, so somehow could decide what transaction or what to write on page 20 in a way that is going to affect the next page and uh, you have a, even the minor choices are going to create a very different committees uh, in charge of creating the next page and therefore you select the ones which are most convenient to you so one of uh, the technical contributions of algorand even though is uh, a bit more technical and not uh, is really to figure out something a different quantity that is a part of the page but is a new quantity and this new quantity has nothing to do with the transaction is somehow a non manipulatable quantity not influential quantity that somehow guarantees that the, the people of the next page are really selected properly and that is um uh, really the zest of the matter and uh it cannot be the block itself it cannot be the payments in the block if there are payments it cannot be the hash of the block it, it can a lot of things cannot be but uh, you have to invent this other quantity that somehow is inductively defined so uh, so w- the quantity of one page somehow determines the quantity of the second page but in a way in which you focus on the problem i want to take out from this quantity all influence from the bad guys and if you face it like this rather than just working with a generic block then you are able to algorand solve the problem today's magic word is steroids s t e r o i d s head over lestarfitcoin.com to sign in enter the magic word and claim your part of the listener reward so uh, so professor you have uh, you have you have walked us through this notion of um uh, to this uh, fundamental component of uh, secret cryptographic sortation and your your claim is that the thousand validators for newspaper page 21 will be generated from the contents of newspaper page 20 and you've also said that in order to select the thousand of newspaper page 21 all of them only have to look at some data inside page number 20 and they self select themselves but how do you ensure that the 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 data on page newspaper page 20 which will determine the selection of the thousand is truly random and cannot be controlled by anybody and how does it exactly work in the algorithm well exactly work is uh, on the on uh, in this medium we uh, even without a, a, a whiteboard that is a little bit uh, much but i can give you the zest So the idea is remember that we do have here a system in which people for instance have a secret key why because any algorand users or any user right is going to say for his user is secret key say to to make payments so there is a secret digital design key okay and moreover 
with a digital design key, right? Who knows it? Only I do know. And uh, are my signatures are predictable by others? Not really, right? Because if we know a billionaire, if we can predict a billionaire's uh, uh, digital signatures, how about we can predict, uh, please, uh, what the signature is, he owns me a billion dollars, right? So there is already uh, in intuitively some randomness, which is not the randomness in the block, but is some randomness comes from the secret key that people use because digital signatures are to be somewhat unpredictable. So now if you combine these things to say there is already a source, a cryptographic source of unpredictability, if you manage it to distill it and to make it something very, very um, uh, random and, and, and small, like a 20 byte random is extracted from that, then you are better served. And if you further constrain so somehow that I cannot shop around with my secret key for many things to sign so that I can pick and choose which random outcome I want from, from being selected. But if the system somehow forces me that I can produce a single digital signature that can be verified, and then from it, this single thing, I extract whether I'm winning of, of my own lottery or not, that, that uh, uh, makes the deal. So essentially, I need to know to, to realize if I'm selected only 20 bytes from the previous page, I use my secret key to de determine a, a proof that only I can produce. And this proof is a proof that actually belongs to the committee of the next page, only with probability one in a thousand. Mm. So you can see that, you know, everybody can, you don't need to select people among the people that are somehow present in the network right now. Rather, once you see the previous page, once you see this 20 byte quantity of the previous page, I somehow do essentially a digital signature. And from it, I can prove to myself that I have nothing to do with the next page, which most of the time that is the case, but the probability one in a thousand, I'm actually called to act on, on uh, to produce the next page. So, and only the people who call to act, even though they were not visible, particularly to other people in the network, so somehow they can certainly propagate one digital signature proving that they're a member of the next page, uh, of the, the committee in charge of the next page. And so these, uh, these proofs now go in the network and everybody knows who, are, who is the committee in charge of determining uh, the next page. Does this make any sense? That actually makes a lot of sense. Although we couldn't go into the te te like technical de details because it might be just too complex without whiteboard. But I, I do get the sense that you are somehow using the randomness embedded inside a private key itself, that a private key has to be random in order to be secure. You're using that sort of randomness to create a process that ends up selecting a thousand people out of a million. But and each of these thousand people select themselves. Each of these yes. thousand people are self-selecting themselves. Yeah. So, um, so now I think we could move move on to the next stage. Right? So, so, so cryptographic secret cryptographic sortation is we have pages one to twenty, and we have a way to get the committee of thousand people to create page twenty one. Now, what happens once we have these once once these thousand people individually know that they they have the power to somehow influence uh, page twenty one? What do they do, and how do they come to consensus? Oh, excellent. So remember that now all of it, so naively, what you, you you should think about doing is the following. Hey, I have a Byzantine agreement on steroid. It almost works with a million people. Surely works with just a thousand people. And now I see who the other thousand people are because they just gave their proof that they belong like me in the committee. So why don't I engage in this Byzantine agreement on steroid, fast and furious Byzantine agreement, to select the, the next page. And by the way, if you remember, this should take roughly on average, you know, nine steps of communication, nine rounds of communication. That's not so bad. Why do I say it's naively? Because remember that I do want to work with a very strong adversary. And uh, I, if I'm a member of this small committee and I send the proof around to the network and the other 999 on average have done the same, Everybody in the world now knows who are the committee in charge of running the fast and furious Byzantine agreement to select the next page. So what is a bad adversary going to do? 
say a bad adversary who just says, you know what, I don't want these guys to agree on anything. He can just corrupt all of them. I mean, mind you, it's not going to be so easy, but maybe he has already corrupted, a, 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 you know, 10% of the people. One thing is to say that you cannot corrupt 10% of the internet. That's okay. That's, uh, that's a good assumption, perhaps. But uh, one thing to say, can you corrupt, you know, now the majority of a thousand people? That's a totally different question. So to corrupt 10% of the internet or 20% of the internet may be out of bounds for anybody. But to corrupt, you know, a small committee, well, uh, maybe it should be possible. So the idea, therefore, is to have this um, Byzantine steroid, to have an additional property that is a, really a new requirement in protocol design, which is, uh, I want to call it player replaceability or generic player protocols, I call them before. But I think player replaceability is really a bit better. Because what does it mean? Because, uh, because computing a committee, essentially, it costs nothing to the network. Each one selects himself. How about if you have a different committee for each step of the Fast and Furious Byzantine Agreement? So there are nine steps, nine committee. No problem. Well, there is, however, a problem, isn't it? Because what is a protocol? even a nine-step message protocol is a discussion. And can you imagine an intelligent discussion if you take people talk once and then they are killed or corrupted by an adversary and take it out, right? And a new set of people come in, which have nothing to do with the first, and they say something and they are immediately killed and a different set of some people comes in and do this for nine times. What can we accomplish in this conversation? they can talk about the waiver, right? So, so, for instance, if I'm now replacing in the middle of a conversation, which I, you know, I don't have any shared variables, inner variables with the pre people before me, I can just say, today the waiver is good, and I get killed. Somebody else replaces me, and out of the blue, what can, uh, can he or she say? He says, you know, let's hope tomorrow is a better day. Uh, generic discussions. We cannot do something as complex to agree on a page that matters. So the idea of Algorand is actually to do this Byzantine agreement that not only is on average, you know, somehow nine steps, not only the people are self-selected at every single step, but they don't need to be the same people. They don't need to be the same number. They can really start afresh from a new set of discussions for nine times in a row. And by magic, somehow meaningful progress is made, even though the, the players who act are totally different players. And that is something that you really need if you want to defeat the adversary. If you want to have a vanilla thing and say, oh, I understand that uh, scaling is good. I take, you know, here is how to do, to use a generically Byzantine agreement. Take a Byzantine agreement, even though it's not on steroids, but you know, scale it down to very few people. You know, then it becomes, you know, almost uh, fast and necessary if you, <laughs> if you really scale it down. But the, what do you People have to consider that if scaling down is a good idea for efficiency, it's terrible for security. Because once you have a small target, the adversary can control all of them. And only if you have this you know, player replaceability property, that you mean that you know, the people who need to speak, they need to send only one message, and then new people will show up in the next uh, round of communication. Then uh, the adversary, if he corrupts me, after I send to the network, I'm Silvio Michali, ever, uh, or I'm public key so and so. Here is the proof that I'm elected, and I'm right to say to talk in step one. And here is my message of step one. Then the adversary say, "Oh, this corrupt him. I'm out." But my message he cannot stop. Remember, my message is now virally reached the adversary by is traveling through the network and is reaching everybody else. And uh, and whoever is going to be belong to the second committee. Even using my generic message, you can start to say something in step two that cannot be stopped by the adversary because the adversary would like to shoot anybody who speaks who doesn't know a priori who is going to speak because the people secretly select themselves for membership in the committee. And the moment in which they announce who they are and say what they have to say is too late for them to corrupt. So this player replaceability that is a new requirement that is satisfied by this um, uh, fast and furious of Byzantine agreement is really what is needed to somehow scale down like crazy 
uh, agreement because you can safely put in charge a small set of people, even though the adversary is plenty capable of attacking somebody uh, anytime uh, he wants, uh, as efficient as he wants. And if it, and, and in fact, actually, even a simple denial of service attack, you start bombarding with a few committee members by player, by, by messages, is going to prevent them from hearing it from each other. So I think it is a very important that if you scale down, you must have this uh, additional property for a Byzantine agreement. So if I, I gave you a partial list of requirements before, now I'm going to extend it. I want a system that the Byzantine agreement is permissionless, that's computationally fast, that has low communication, that, uh, and that is player replaceable. So that if I am in the middle of execution, I'm corrupted, it doesn't matter. The, the computation correctly keeps on going all, all the time. That actually, to me, when I, when I hear that, it sort of seems impossible. Because like, like the imagination that comes to my head is like, like here's, there's a big room. So imagine, you know, um, imagine it's like the Pope is being elected and you know, there's a thousand cardinals inside the Sistine Chapel, right? That's a good image. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, like they have to agree on a Pope, right? So they can, they can send a message. You know, there's like two candidates or something. They can write down the candidate name and they can send a message or something. And there's going to be nine rounds of communication, right? So some of the cardinals are going to speak in round one, some of the cardinals in round two, some in round three, and some in round nine. If you're one of the cardinals, you get to speak only once, right? You need to send only one message, right? And once you send that message, you can be corrupted, right? So it's like 1000 divided by nine is what? 133 or something, Some maybe, I don't know, 111 or something like that, right? So 111 cardinals send a message, they are corrupted. Then the next 111 send a message, they are corrupted. The next 111 send a message, then they're corrupted and so on. But even with that system, the Pope gets elected. So here is a, a step that is part of any actually, every Byzantine agreement ever fought uh, uh, since the invention uh, uh, roughly 40 years ago of Byzantine Agreement a itself, right? 35 years ago, whatever. So an important step is somehow to take majority, right? I mean, you can imagine that this is very intuitive, right? So you say, uh, you count how many people said X, say, in the, in the step before, and say, if, say, uh, two thirds of the people said X, right? then uh, you, you do Y, else you do something else, right? They are not the only, the only type of instruction in a Byzantine agreement, but it is mm. a component of an instruction. Now think of this. Assume that even, they are not even in the Sistine Chapel where you can actually more or less see each other on the page, but the Cardinals, because there is this Byzantine agreement that it works so, with an adversary, they stay at home in, all over the world, and they talk to one another, right? In a way that the adversary cannot control. So think about this. If I see, I am somehow, um, I, I'm part of the first batch of cardinals selected, and uh, I say X and somebody says Z and so on and so forth. And then I'm immediately corrupted. Now you are part of the second batch, and the instruction is of the type how many people in the first batch said X? Do you need to, know, to be me in order to make this determination? No, why? Because whoever is in the first batch of cardinals say something and whatever is he or she says propagates for the network. And so it reaches you even though you're not part of the first batch of the cardinal. So you can make an easy determination of the kind, how many people said X? even though you are not at all part of, of, of the first batch. So the old trick is to define the entire protocol so that only realizes on instructions like this, instructions that allow for player replaceability. I mean, that is the, 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 the essence of the problem is to take mm. um, essentially a discussions in which you know, to be player replaceable, you can talk about the waiver, 
you can talk about random things, but you can talk about minimally more interesting things, such as determine branch on an instruction if two thirds said X, do a this, otherwise do something else, right? This is also player replaceable. So and if all the instruction in this fast and furious protocol that has all the property that everybody ever wanted from Bison Zero Agreement also guarantees that the instructions are all of this type, then you're done. And that's what, what the, the, the system is. Take a, what seems a very complex uh, agreement protocol and distill it to something that not only is very fast, not only people can self-select, but also um, uh, is permissionless and everything else, but also has this other uh, um, property of a player replaceability. So that the conversation keeps on going and you get to wherever you want to go, you reach the right conclusion, even though people every time they speak are corrupted. So earlier in the in the discussion, we talked about forking and, and how uh, forking um, was, uh, well, it, it, is, it is a problem in Bitcoin, especially in terms of user experience. Uh, when you make a transaction, you, know, you, you have to assume uh, that you're, you're waiting for blocks to come in um, in order for that transaction to be, to be safely validated. Let's take the discussion then, sort of the logical next step into how this player replaceability prevents forking, or at least makes forking a very, very, very low probabilistic event. Ah, great. So player replaceability speaks about the ability of a, the protocol not to be impeded, allows a protocol to go on for nine steps, even though the adversary can corrupt or create a denial of service uh, against the, uh, uh, at, uh, to the members of every single step. But the whole protocol, the whole Byzantine agreement, right, is a probabilistic protocol that allows you to get the right decision. So because to agree completely on the, on the page, you really want to say that there has to be a right decision. And the, prob uh, the probability that the right decision is taken is essentially, I'm, I'm thinking of it like one minus one over a trillion. So the probability something goes wrong is one in a trillion, okay? So now one in a trillion, well, assume that every page is, takes 10 minutes, uh, when you expect uh, somehow to have a, uh, to have a fork in, in the system? Once every 1.9 million years, roughly speaking, one every 2 million years. Now with this time scale, in some sense, you can even forget about forks. Because in a time scale of two million years, we have to much more worry about the surviving of our species <laughs> rather than uh, the, a fork in our payment networks, right? I mean, that's a, that's a very long time. Nonetheless, should a fork occur, uh, Algorand does also a fork resolution. But, but what I'm saying is that uh, you don't have to even bother to think about it, right? Because uh, the probability is so low and that is a variable that you can set to whatever you want. And I thought setting it uh, uh, to one in a trillion, uh, also known as a one in 10 to the 12, <laughs> is low enough. By the way, there is such a thing, a notion that is generally used for a, a catastrophic event, such as uh, uh, we don't want a plane to go down, you know, with probability uh, greater than one in 10 to the 10. And you know, as they say one in 10 to the 10, let's make, when people worry about their money very often more than their lives, let's make it even 10 times uh, lower. You know what, make it 100 times lower. So now we have a 10 to the minus 12, one in a trillion. And if you don't like this, wait to see if there is a fork over before you rely on your thing, right? But you know, but I think it's, uh, well, I suspect to be good enough for most people because again, you know, uh, whatever happens to two million years uh, from now, if there is a fork, we'll deal. Uh, our ancestors, uh, our uh, descendants, the descendants, the descendants, the descendants, descend, descend, we'll have to worry about it. But, but in any case, there is also a fork resolution process if you really want, right? Okay, good. That's uh, that's that's reassuring that there's a fork resolution process because you know probably probabilistically it could happen next year. You know the fork could happen, uh, you know, in our lifetime. Bound of a probability, but yes, in principle, it's good to have something that is something else. <laughs> So, so before we we we, you know, we close the show here, there's a few other things that we want to talk about. Uh, but uh, th there's there is one topic that uh, keeps coming up again and again and again and again when talking about blockchains, and specifically in the realm of Bitcoin, 
and that is scalability. And I'm, I'm sure you're at least familiar with the topic of the block size and how that has become a debate that has uh, been ongoing for the last, oh, you know, God knows how many years. Um, and, and there are multiple proposals on um, how we should address scalability in Bitcoin. And what it essentially comes down to uh, is, uh, well, should uh, Bitcoin be a network that is sort of all inclusive and allows for a high volume of transactions? uh while perhaps um, succumbing to the risk of being uh, centralized or should we preserve uh, sort of the ideals of Nakamoto where the network is, is decentralized but potentially um, having really high demand on the network for, with a limited amount of transactions per block and then therefore perhaps having high transaction fees so you know the those are I'm sort of paraphrasing here making sim simplistic analogies but that's uh what it kind of comes down to how does, Algorand uh, addressed this. Is this the, is is block size something that is even addressed in Algorand? Is it something that you've thought about, or perhaps you have some uh, some interesting insights for the for the Bitcoin community on how this should handle scaling? Yeah. So essentially, here is what uh, what uh, remember there are many competing forces when you want to do a public ledger, and so Bitcoin is a specific public ledger, and um, and so somehow has. Uh, a certain block size uh, um, and so on and so forth. And because also as to avoid forks, would not to be too often. So everything, you know, is balanced out. Algorand does things differently, right? So think about it. So uh, if if you want a decentralized system, the page that you, what before thinking about the size of a page is how do you distribute the page? Well, if it is a decentralized system, you have to distribute by gossiping. So I send this page to my, say, eight or 10 of my neighbors. They will sell them to random eight of, 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 of their friends, and so on and so forth. And, and then there is a, a, a amount of time in which it takes for uh, this page propagated this way to reach everybody or 95% of the people on Earth. So there are very few hopes, but nonetheless, there is some limitation intrinsic latency, which is the time for a page to go around the network in a distributed manner to reach everybody. Well, what Algorand does, he says, this limitation is the only limitation. Because the other limitation, the computation is not there to limit anybody. To decide that you are part of a committee, you do a digital signature, and only the people who, who win propagate their signature. That's a, a nonsense. This is a small small potatoes relative to a block, right? And so, and, and you do this nine times, oh, <laughs> big deal, okay? So the, the really, ultimately, you can bound, say the, the latency in Algorand coincides essentially with the latency, right, of, uh, of, uh, of the intrinsic latency of moving a block until it reaches everybody. That's all. So, so the, in the... some sense, better than this Algorand or nobody else who wants to be really decentralized can be, because it is the order of this plus my, uh, small potatoes, right? So more than this you cannot get. So therefore, you can just say, well, what the immediate thing is that if our networks becomes faster, hey, my oh my, so assume we double uh, the speed, we can send you know, um, uh, twice as many blocks in Algorand right away. And they can be rel relied upon right away rather than in an hour or uh, 200 minutes, right? Point one. Point two is, uh, is, is that uh, if you want to do Algorand on uh, where the validators are actually, say, um, a separate entity, that's an option. Is a political option. Is a... Is a is a business compromise that you may want to do. You may actually have two algorithms, right? One for the libertarians and one for the people who accept somehow banks or other people uh, to to uh, to do just the validation. You can choose who is your own validator, right? And uh, you can share fees if uh, uh, he constructs the blocks with you. That is all within the algorithm uh, portfolio of options. But what is the, the idea? If, if you subcontract this to a bunch of validators, say to 10,000 validators of the more the merrier, but these are actually have a proprietary network, say bank network, 
well, you know, we are not talking about the 10, uh, 10 uh, one megabyte uh, per second of it. Uh, uh, common folks have now uh, you can have a, uh, a gigabyte per, uh, per second networks and therefore uh, the whole thing scales like crazy so to me as a, as a the designer of algorand my responsibility was to make sure that no forks nothing else impedes the latency of my system and so the latency of algorand is really coincides with an intrinsic absolutely necessary latency needed to propagate a block plus epsilon okay that's 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 the message and then you can actually say if the network improves the thing we can automatically improve because we don't have to avoid that forks occur too often because forks has nothing to do with you know is a largely different than the, the, the speed of the network moreover if you want to go on a sub network which is even faster then the sky is the limit then you can uh, right but more than this in a distributed system to guarantee that there is this, uh, the latency coincides with intrinsic latency, more than this it cannot do. So in, in, in summary, um, we have a, a consensus mechanism that is being made available to us that is uh, that relies on trivial computation that is truly demograph uh, democratic in the sense that it, it does not distinguish between um, miners or validators and nodes um, that is scalable, that prevents to a very high probability uh, forks, and also, and most importantly, I would say, eliminates the block size debate. Um, uh, what, what are the next steps here? Because this seems like a very elegant solution. Uh, where are you in the sort of roadmap of deploying this, have you considered, you know, right, is, is someone writing this algorithm so that it can be used in blockchain networks? Well, um, uh, great question. F first of all, um, I'm, I'm so, uh, let me make it very clear that I'm fully determined to see that this technology is deployed and that actually can be uh, an engine for societal and uh, business uh, growth. And um, so um, uh, that is uh, for sure. And um, uh, right now I'm doing uh, further optimization in, in the fear of it and a formal proof, uh, not only just uh, some of the basic intuition, but the things that are uh, crossing all T's and crossing all I's. And then, you know, with uh, a wonderful group of uh, very talented colleagues, we are actually uh, working on ensuring that there are no technical issues in the implementations as a separate from the design. And uh, that's all I'm prepared to say at this point in time. Have you reached out to anybody from the blockchain space? So like, because there's, there's lots of really smart people that are, are not necessarily academics, but uh, people that are working on things like Casper, on Tenerit PBFT, um, and that are sort of influential within the blockchain space. Have you reached out to those people? So first of all, I must say, I agree on one thing, that uh, these are very smart people. So I'm not saying I'm not uh, part of any blog uh, on that way is, is, uh, a, is a generational thing and is uh, much more uh, also perhaps you know, much more of my traditional academic style. But uh, I'm very impressed uh, by the level of ideas and talent. And, uh, you know, uh, real intelligence is uniformly distributed. <laughs> Let it be known that it's not the monopolies of universities and think tank and think like this. It's amazing how many um, smart ideas people have. In fact, actually, is um, no day goes by that on a new smart conference, all kinds of a great application of a ledger um, occur. So, and I think that actually Algorand uh, would love to somehow leverage all this you know, creativity that it, it, it goes on uh, there. So it's not only about money, it's not about, about cryptocurrency, it's not about an electronic payment, if you want to have a, a not self-floating uh, currency, it's really about a public ledger. And essentially this idea that uh, we actually have, we endow society for, for to have a common trusted party. Now, Trusted parties are already rare. Common is even rarer, right? Because I may have some, my 10 people who are a trusted party, you may have your own, there may be no intersection, 
But think about it suddenly for this ledger, we essentially we share a common trusted party that can be leveraged in so many ways. So they are very smart, I agree, and there is so much to read, and, and I'm, <laughs> I'm a slow in reading and, uh, and a slow in communicating, but I will try to, uh, to reach uh, everybody in the way I know, you know, conferences, uh, talks, you know, I'm not a, a blogger, that is not me, it's not it's, uh, it's a, a generational <laughs> issue perhaps, or is a, is a, of, uh, is a little bit uh, who I am, but uh, I certainly I do want a confrontation of ideas and uh, and we'll find to publicize Algorand in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in, in, in the ways I'm most familiar with, right? And so, I mean, this is, in fact, you know, this is probably one really good uh, uh, channel to, to reach uh, that, you know, to bridge the gaps between, you know, the, this, uh, this sort of academic uh, community uh, in which you're part of and, and this blockchain community. If people want to reach out to you and perhaps get involved or, you know, collaborate or, or contribute to some code, uh, how can you do that? My plan is to put something out there. I'm not a... a let them, your, I'm not an avid email reader, so I must say that very often I read uh, 10 emails a day when I get overwhelmed and I don't read the others. So it's, uh, nobody should take offense if I'm not <laughs> respond. I didn't know that I was signing up for receiving a lot of emails, but, uh, but I think that's, that's the positive news. And uh, I, I certainly, you know, I'm... Uh, <laughs> I am here in uh, in Cambridge. My door is always open. It works much better than an email, and my telephone it works better with email at least with me. And until uh, such a time in which there is uh, somebody handling call that is not me, I think uh, would be the preferred mode of interacting. But you know, things uh, may change soon. Thanks. Okay, well, I, we've, we're at the end of our show here. We've went uh, over the normal scheduled amount of time that we usually take, but uh, I think we, we could have went on for much longer. Uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing how Algorand uh, develops, uh, looking forward to seeing perhaps some, some code uh, and seeing this being implemented as part of you know, some sort of blockchain network. Um, I'm anxious to see uh, you know, when, when actual real-life testing and, and at scale uh, starts to emerge. So... Thank you very much, Professor, for joining us today. It was a fascinating discussion, and we look forward to seeing uh, where this takes us in the future. Thank you, Sebastian, Sebu, Meher. It has been a lot of fun. Thanks. And so thank you also to our listeners for tuning in. We are part of Let's Talk Bitcoin Network. You can find lots of great shows uh, about Bitcoin, blockchain, Ethereum, decentralized technologies, all kinds of good stuff over at letstalkbitcoin.com. We release new episodes of Epicenter every Monday. You can download uh, the audio version uh, through iTunes, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also tune in on uh, YouTube to watch the video episodes. And uh, you can also uh, leave us a tip. The tipping address is in the description uh, of the show. And uh, we're also always interested in getting reviews on iTunes. It helps uh, the show being discovered. And uh, it's always very encouraging to uh, see you guys comment and uh, leave reviews on iTunes. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.